Can you make sure you click the subscribe button for my channel and the notifications button so you will be updated when my next podcast goes out? You can also follow me on social media. My Facebook page is James English 11 My Twitter is James English 0 My Instagram is James English 2 And you can also download these podcasts on Podbean and iTunes. And we're on. Today's guest, we've got the lovely man, George Galloway. How are you? Oh, great. It's a great pleasure. What a success you've been. Uh -huh, thank you. Fantastic. Really. It's great it. to see working class mm -hmm. Scottish people breaking through in the media. I'll tell you, there's not a lot of them around. <laughs> but a real breed, George. Indeed. <laughs> How you been? Good. Busy. Television every day, radio once a week on a Friday night. I'm making a film. I've got four kids under 12. Uh, and I'm probably running for the European Parliament elections in Manchester, Liverpool, the northwest of England, if we are fighting those elections. And at the time of recording, that's not exactly clear yet. So, not got time to scratch my arse, but I'm doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> for, for working so hard at your, your young age, um, how do you manage to keep doing it? I've never lost uh, enthusiasm, never for a single day. Uh, I, I wake up every morning as determined as any other morning uh, to pursue the things I'm interested in, the causes I believe in, chase the enemies uh, that I hate, uh, <laughs> that I hate with the same vengeance I did decades uh, mm. before. So uh, I guess that's unusual. Um, I've never had a moment's doubt about the kind of life I wanted to lead. Never had a moment's doubt about the things I believe in. Uh, and I stand for the same things now that I did when I was a young man in a council mm -hmm. housing uh, scheme, as we called them on the East Coast, uh, all these decades ago. And Dundee? Yeah, uh, in Lochie, actually, which was the... Irish quarter of the city. It was known as Tipperary. I was born in a slum. I uh, lived in an attic for the first four years of my life outside toilet. Shared it with eight other families. Then I moved to a council house, which was like, I mean, frankly, like moving into a palace, a council house in Dundee uh, when you came from the slums. Uh, but recently I was back there. I took my kids down the street that I was brought up in. The slum's long gone, but the council house is still there. Uh, and I think they were amazed. Uh, the, the householder very kindly invited me in when he saw me looking, and he was amazed that I used to live there. Mm -hmm. uh, and my kids were amazed that, you know, a family of five as we were could have actually lived happily in that tiny wee house. Uh, but we did, and it was very mm -hmm. happy, and I, I have only happy memories of it. Which is a good thing because it's difficult in housing estates. It's difficult getting raised up in, well, as you say, slums are, yeah. because it is a, it's a struggle. But you've clearly did well for yourself. You've clearly worked hard. You've clearly grafted. Of God, yeah. yeah, but nothing comes easy either. But no. you, you make your own luck in life, and you've, you're no you're no short of controversy either. You believe in, you stick to what you believe in, mm. which is massive respect from me for that because right. it takes a lot of balls to to stick to what you believe in, especially in this day and age as well. When you first started growing up, because I believe you were the youngest person ever to be elected at Labour at 14 or 15 years old, or Actually, I, chairman. Went, I went through a period of being the youngest ever everything uh, <laughs> in Scottish <laughs> Labour politics. So I was the youngest ever constituency Labour Party secretary. I think I was under 18. Uh, I was the youngest ever elected member of the party's Scottish executive. I was 21. Uh, I was the youngest ever chairman of the whole Scottish Labour Party at 26. Now, that's a record that will never be taken off me because I think you've got to be 56 to join the Scottish Labour Party <laughs> now. There's certainly not many uh, young people flocking to join it, unfortunately, I should say. Um, so, yeah, I was for a long time the youngest ever everything. And uh, one of the sadnesses about getting old is that now you're the oldest. <laughs> now you're the oldest ever everything. How did you, so with that drive and determination to succeed in life, where did 
the, the politics side of things come into play? Why did you get into politics? I was born into it, really. Uh, my father was a trade union activist, a shop steward, a branch official in the AEU, as it was known then, uh, the Amalgamated Engineering Union. It's now a part of Unite. Uh, my mother, from an Irish Republican tradition, uh, taught me everything I needed to know, and her family did, about imperialism, empire, the role of the British in Ireland, uh, the role of the Irish in Scotland, uh, and how difficult it was for Irish immigrants in Scotland. Some things have changed, some things mm -hmm. haven't uh, about that. Uh, so, in a way, it was a perfect synthesis for me because it meant that I grew up in the labor movement tradition and in the Irish Republican anti-colonial, anti-imperialist tradition. And that's where I still stand today at the age of 64. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the state of politics is now and for an independent Scotland? Because I know you went and voted against an independent <laughs> Scotland. What do you think the outcome would be now if they were to have another vote? Well, I think the fact that the SNP don't want to have another vote uh, tells you that they, like me, uh, believe that they would again lose it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think the case against it is stronger today than it was uh, when we had the last once-in-a-lifetime referendum uh, on the matter. Well, let me be clear, Scotland has a right to be an independent country, and if the Scottish people voted for it to be so, no power on earth could stop them. Uh, I just don't think it's the best thing. If I was persuaded it was the best thing, I would support it. Um, but I don't. And uh, I'm not saying that'll be the case forever. I mean, if you told me, for example, that the Tories will be in power at Westminster for another 50 years, if you told me that Jeremy Corbyn had no chance whatsoever of becoming prime minister of a united country, uh, well, that would change my mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not a question of principle. The principle is clear. Scotland has national rights of self-determination. They have the right to exercise them anytime they like. In other words, you could have a referendum every year if you liked. Uh, but the fact that Nicola Sturgeon will not trigger a new independence referendum is, I think, because she knows, even though she'll never admit it, that Actually, Scottish people are pretty canny. Uh, we count pennies. We know that money doesn't come easy. And we know that leaping off the cliff into a breakup of this small island uh, and, a, and a hooking up with a European Union that's falling apart in front of our eyes, adopting the euro, free movement of cheap labor, and so on. Once that went under a relentless microscope, in a four or six weeks campaign, I think the case for separation would fall apart. And what about, what do you think of the Theresa May and the Brexit thing just now? Well, um, at the time of recording, uh, Theresa May is sitting down literally uh, at a meeting with Jeremy Corbyn to negotiate the terms of a Brexit. Now, these are words you could never have said even a few days ago. And by the time this comes out, uh, it yeah, may all have crashed and burned. <laughs> uh, but at the time of recording, it looks like, uh, to me, that uh, Corbyn and May will, will reach an agreement. And uh, therefore, we will Brexit on the 22nd of May. It won't be the Brexit I've been looking for, fighting for. Uh, but it'll be a Brexit. And moreover, it will be one that between Labour and Tory will be able to command a very stable majority in the House of Commons. That's what you call famous last words, because by the time you see this, you might be laughing, a belly laugh, at the naivety of what I've just said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you've, um, like I say, you've been nothing short of controversy through your career. And sure. You've had the balls to do things that... Mm to stand out there because you spoke about against like Bush and um, Tony Blair and stuff they said they had blood in your hands for like wars and stuff how was that through the time what were you meaning then well I knew that Tony Blair was a wrong and uh, the first time I set eyes on him literally 
uh, I, I knew that no good could come uh, of him becoming the leader of the Labour Party. Him and his crew, Peter Mandelson and the other Blairites that are still around today, haunting the corridors of power. And that was before he started five wars in four years, the biggest number of wars ever fought by any British leader, royal or common, in the whole history of the country. Five wars in four years. Uh, but even before that, I knew he was a wrong and I knew that he uh, wasn't really Labour, uh, that he was hijacking Labour, that he would fly it to destruction. And that's precisely what he did. Uh, the near destruction of the Labour Party, its actual destruction in Scotland, arguably, uh, a near-death experience from which only the emergence of Jeremy Corbyn uh, saved it. And uh, we'll see what happens in the next months, pardon me, a couple of years, as to whether it uh, has been saved or whether it was a false dawn. Uh, so I fought against uh, Tony Blair to his face from the first, before he even became the leader. Uh, I said at the Scottish Labour Conference in uh, Inverness in 1993 uh, that uh, he might have a pretty face, uh, <laughs> but uh, don't buy a pig in a poke. Uh, <laughs> and he was sitting as close to me as you are now. Uh, and I said it uh, at the rostrum right in front of him. Uh, I opposed everything he did. Um, I'm not saying he had no achievements. He obviously did. Uh, setting up a Scottish Parliament was one. Uh, bringing John Major's peace process in the north of Ireland into the harbour was another. Uh, but for all the good that he did, the amount of bad and harm that he did was simply enormous. And our children and their children unborn uh, will continue to pay the price for the things that Tony Blair did. Does it, with politics, there's obviously a lot of power behind the curtain. Does anybody ever pull you aside and say, George, man, fucking be quiet? Or is it, can it be scary? Can it be like, <clears throat> no, stuff out against your life? Because or? I'm a religious believer, I, 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 I'm only playing for the big election, you know, the judgment day uh, on the last day. And that's the only election that really counts for me. Uh, yeah, uh, but not in a sinister way. Uh, the late John Smith, God rest his soul, who was a good friend of mine, was the Labour leader before Blair. He did say to me, you know, tamp it down a bit on this and that, uh, and I can promote you and put you on the front bench and so on. Uh, but that's not really me. And uh, whilst I don't have to say everything that I believe on every conceivable occasion... Mm -hmm. I cannot pretend not to believe it. Yeah. Uh, I cannot say anything that I don't believe. That's impossible for me. It's in all conscience I could not do that. Whereas if you're going to get on up the political greasy pole, you've got to be willing and able to do that. And so the people I grew up with, for example, in the Labour Party and Labour movement in Scotland throughout the 70s, who were far more left-wing than me, uh, communists, Trotskyists, and so on, they ended up in Tony Blair's war cabinet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not joking. Uh, I mean, a, a, a fellow like John Reid, for example, Dr. John Reid, now Lord Reid, used to be the chairman at Celtic for a time. Uh, he was a communist when I first met him, and a really hard-line communist. And he used to chide me for not being a communist. And he ended up Tony Blair's war minister pulverizing brown people across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, now, people can change their mind, of course. I just have never changed mine. Yeah. Uh, but if you are changing your mind, you've got to explain why. You've got to say, I was wrong then, and I'm right now, mm -hmm. and here are the reasons I was wrong then. But these people just tiptoed across the political stage, and that's wrong. Is that, does money come into play then? Well, Dr. John Reed is a very rich man now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, all these people have gone on to seats on the boards of, uh, of arms companies and uh, international conglomerates of all kinds. So, yeah, uh, not so much money at the time, but the prospect of money later. But by the grace of God, I have never given a, a toss about money. Uh, I, I, I have more than enough money, and what money I've got, 
I work for. I work every day. I'm a, I'm a day rate worker. Mm-hmm. A working man in his prime, as Sir Van Morrison would say. <laughs> Do you think that's the Scottish mentality? It comes into play there. Stand on your own two feet. Don't take any shite and stick to what you believe in. I think so. It's the best of what I believe to be Scottishness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we do look after our uh, money. Imagine our house. My wife is Dutch, and they're the meanest people on the planet. And I'm Scottish, and we're the second meanest. Uh, so there's there's no chance of a pound escape, escaping at our door without being carefully uh-huh. scrutinised. You've um, you probably she one, asks me every day how much have we made today. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly working seven days a week. You must yeah. be making something. You clearly you're probably the one of the, the ever Scottish man to get into the U.S. Senate and absolutely rip them on your ass. Um, how was that feeling? That was my best day so far, no doubt. Uh, God gave me wings that day, gave me breath, and uh, I felt I was flying. And that was confirmed afterwards when I walked out the door and a a black janitor came up and high-fived me. It was the first high-five I'd ever done, actually. (laughs) High-fived me and said, way to go, man. You just sent George Bush back to his ranch. (laughs) (laughs) Because they accused you of making money from um, oil. but. They never asked me back yeah. for a second. Uh, but you stood up for what you believed in and you yeah, won. Yeah. That's become a multi-million bestseller. Uh, if you look at it on YouTube, it's up hundreds of times. And if you add them all up, it's tens of millions of mm-hmm. views. It made me famous in America. I now got a daily television show in America. I tour America. And in America, they pay you to give speeches. It's not like here. I tour <laughs> America coast to coast, <laughs> north to south. They made me big in, in America, so the, the law of unintended consequences kicked in. How were you feeling that day then, going into that? Were you Don't worried? Me. Were you scared? No, no. Or were you grinders? People ask me that all the time, and they also asked, did you prepare? Uh, not only did I not prepare, I had absolutely no need to because everything that I was going to say was on the tip of my tongue, mm-hmm. on the tip of my fingers. And secondly, far from being scared, it was, it was a complete joy for me to get up close and personal with these war criminals almost within punching distance better than punching distance because you had all these cameras from around the world filming it so it was it was the opportunity the mother of all opportunities and i i was a boxer when i was young and you can always tell when you're in a boxing ring the moment when your opponent no longer wants to be there uh, and vice versa also uh, they can tell from your eyes. Something dies in their eyes and they're looking around for the bell, for the towel coming in. Uh, and I saw that on the senator's face really quite early on. I could just think of them saying to themselves, can I swear on here? Of course you can, it's anything goes. Uh, I could think of them saying to themselves, whose fucking idea was this? We've misunderestimated this guy. Uh, we thought he was a working class tag from a council house in Dundee. And here he is live on television across the world, <laughs> knocking fuck out of us. And, and, and there's still half an hour to go. Uh, that's how it looked to me from where I was sitting. And afterwards, I think almost universally, uh, people, people agreed with that. Because you got but a lot of respect for that. I did. And, and, and also from enemies and opponents, you mm-hmm. know. I think for uh, a class of British person, it was a triumph of the House of Commons over the American uh, Senate and government system. It was a triumph for uh, a relatively uneducated. I left school at 17, went to work in a a tire factory in Michelin Tires, never went to university, no Oxford, no Cambridge, no Eton, no fancy debating chambers, nothing like that. It was a triumph for that. So working class people, I think, saw something in that. Scottish people saw something in that. Irish people saw something in it. Uh, it, it was a triumph. There's no mm-hmm. other way of, uh, of putting that. Mm-hmm. If I could bottle that and sell it, uh, yeah. it be would, a uh, I'd be a billionaire. Yeah. Because um, I always say, you know, no matter what you do in life, you're going to be liked and you're going to be hated, sure, no matter sure. what. If you stand for something. Yeah, of course, what you believe in, you're never going to please everybody. Sure. You're a massive um, supporter of Palestine. Mm. How did that come about as well? By accident. Uh, up to a point. I mean, I knew that 
we were on the side of the Palestinians back in 1975, uh, but only in a vague way. I, I had never met an Arab. I had never met a Palestinian. I had never met a Muslim. Uh, and just by chance, in midsummer of 1975, a Palestinian came to the door of the Dundee Labour Party office in one Rattray Street, where I was at work on a printing machine, printing leaflets, and where I also lived. And there was no one else uh, in the office. So I wasn't going to answer the door because my hands were covered in ink, but the bell kept on ringing. So I opened it, and there was this fellow who looked like Omar Sharif, but I thought all Arabs looked like Omar Sharif at that time. I, I did learn differently. Uh, and then he came, he said he wanted to speak to the leaders of the local Labour Party about Palestine. He was a student at Dundee University. Uh, I said, there's none of the leaders here, but you can talk to me and I'll talk to them. Uh, and he spoke in such a mesmerizing way that by the end of his talk and the discussion, I was a signed up supporter, more than a supporter. Two years later, I went to uh, Beirut uh, in a lull in the civil war there, so 1977. I lived in Palestinian refugee camps. I met the late President Yasser Arafat. He took a liking to me. So that would be 77, so I was uh, 23. Uh, Arafat took a liking to me. He asked me to stay on when the rest left. I grew very close to him, and I remained so until... I was at his deathbed in Paris, uh, and, uh, and so I, I became completely absorbed, not just in the Palestinian cause, but in Arabic culture, Islamic culture, the food, the music, the birds. Uh, <laughs> I need to get myself there then. <laughs> uh, uh, there was music in the cafe at nights and revolution in the air. Mm -hmm. It was for a man of my age in that period in the 70s. You'd have to have been there. The 70s was a really revolutionary mm -hmm. era when everything seemed possible. Uh, and uh, I've spent my whole life uh, in that. I would have stayed on, but Arafat told me to go. He said, if we find you still here, we'll shoot you. Because uh, I'd been offered a job as the Labour Party's full-time organizer in Dundee. And I said to him, will I go or will I stay? Uh, and uh, he said, if we, if we find you around here, we'll shoot you. You've got mm -hmm. to go because you can do far more for our cause in British politics mm -hmm. than you can do hanging about. More dangerous over there. street corner in Beirut. Yeah, I'd probably be dead by now. Yeah. So and there's a lot of wars in this world. A lot of wars we don't hear of as well. Violence is controlled. There's a lot of power behind the money industry, the oil, whatever. If you were, if you were president, or if you were prime minister, what would you do to make this world a better place? That's a very big question. And being half an Irishman, I'm entitled to say, as the Irishman apocryphally did when asked the directions to Dublin, I wouldn't have started from here. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, so much has gone so wrong and we're so far down the rabbit hole, it's not easy to say how we could get out. The first thing you've got to do when you're in a hole is stop digging. So if I was the president, the prime minister, I'd stop digging the hole that we're in and then work out how to get out of it. What do I mean by stop digging? stop invading and occupying other people's countries, stop uh, propping up tyrants and dictators around the world, stop ripping other people off, stop robbing them, uh, stop selling weapons to criminals, uh, and stand on our own two feet and be an independent mm -hmm. country. It's one of the reasons why I support Brexit, because I don't want to be following a foreign policy that's decided by other people, either the United States or the European Union in league with the United mm -hmm. States. Who can we trust though, George? For people running the country, I always believe that if people are divided, the world's easier to control. Mm -hmm. I believe that if I look into these people's eyes, I don't fucking trust them. I, I'm a man who likes to concentrate on me and provide for me and do what's right for me. I just don't think when you look at 
people who are leading the countries and the things they say, do they have people's best interests at their own heart? Are they controlled with the money that's the pulling the strings behind them? It's a well, I think you're right to be cynical. I was going to say skeptical, but cynicism is a better description uh, because they've earned your cynicism, uh, if not your contempt. Uh, there's no doubt, not only that we are led by pirates uh, in almost every country, uh, but that the pirates aren't even as big as they used to be, as good as they used to be. Uh, you know, I think... Greta Garbo, I think, somebody said to her, you used to be big in the pictures. She said, I'm still big. It's the pictures that got small. Mm -hmm. uh, the political class has got smaller everywhere. If you, I mean, if you imagine that the president of the United States could be a joker like Donald Trump, that the prime minister of Britain could be a dullard, a robot like Theresa May, or that the president of France could be little Macron shooting his people down every Saturday afternoon in their yellow vests. Uh, if you go across the world, it's the same in almost every country, that not only are they pirates, they're not even very impressive as mm. pirates. And that's why their, their whole shtick, their whole game is running into trouble, because... The world is changing. China is rising. Russia is rising. India is rising. Uh, South Africa is rising. All of Africa will soon be rising. And the sun is rising there mm. and sinking here. And it's partly a reflection of that, that our leaders are such Lilliputians. So do you, what country do you look at and go... Because I believe everything's model image. If somebody's doing something right, then mm. model them until you mm. find out a better way how to go above them. What country would you look at and say they're thriving? Well, I'd, 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 well China is the obvious success story in the world today. Uh, China has lifted more people out of poverty than any regime ever in the history of humankind. Uh, China has more than a billion of a population, getting on for a billion and a half. It's taken 800 million people out of poverty in the last 30 years. Uh, so economically speaking, you'd have to say China, uh, which is a synthesis of socialist planning with capitalist uh, activity, uh, if you like, a synthesis that all of us, I believe, in the end will have to search for and find. Uh, I think a leader uh, like... Uh, Putin, uh, who stands up uh, for the independence of his country, he, Putin has again lifted gigantic proportion of the population of Russia out of the poverty that they slumped into at the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and has restored Russia's standing in the world. Now, you don't have to want to be Chinese or want to be Russian. I want to be neither. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've got to look at systems and leaderships that are doing a good thing for their own people. Turkey, with all its uh, many problems, the Turkish leadership has managed to synthesize an Islamic philosophy with uh, capitalist economics and has done very well. The Turkish economy is, uh, is doing very well for a time until very recently, it was absolutely booming. Its growth rate was higher than China's. Uh, I'm a big uh, friend, as you probably know, of Cuba. Uh, Cuba is a country, a very small island, which has uh, chosen not to worship the dollar, but to uh, worship the collective, and has made for itself a culture and a, a political system which, whether you want to be in it or not, again, is another matter. I don't want to be in any of these countries. Yeah. Uh, but Cuba has a, a greater life expectancy for its children than the United States, a longer uh, life expectancy, lower child mortality, uh, better health system than developed capitalist countries like Sweden and Denmark. Uh, so all these countries have done something right. Mm -hmm. And... We ought to learn from what they've done right. 
we, on the other hand, have done everything wrong. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot of courage to pull away from Cuba, from the dollar, who maybe think they miss out on the material stuff, because yeah. I know they drive about in old-fashioned cars and they do, they do all that stuff. Things are beauty, by the way. Yeah, but if the, the life expectancy is higher, and your life, the most valuable currency in life is yeah, your own is life. your life, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And the, so, and the health of your children. Yeah, and if you look you at... You know in Cuba, if your child is born successfully, it will live till nearly 90 years. Mm -hmm. Imagine in a poor third world country, before the revolution, before Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Camilo Cienfuegos, and the great heroes of the Cuban revolution, you'd be very lucky to see 45. Mm -hmm. Now you'll live till nearly 90. That's worth a lot. Did you That's ever, a human right, by the way. Did you ever meet any of those men? I, I'm a biographer of Fidel Castro. I met him hundreds of times. I've spent... Uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of hours in his company. He's the greatest man I ever met by a country mile. How, uh, yeah, he's a very powerful man over there, wasn't he? Because you've met a lot of powerful men. You've met guys like Saddam Hussein. How was he as well? He was steady when I met him. I mean, I met him twice uh, in 1993 with a group of, of uh, MEPs, ironically, as I might be about to become one. Uh, just briefly and in a big crowd, but I met him man to man in 2002 in the summer, uh, just before the war, therefore. Uh, man to man, translator, maybe one or two, but almost you could say tete a tete, as they say in diplomatic circles. He was steady, he was uh, not crazy at all, uh, not nearly as dangerous as the people that came to power in Iraq after we uh, toppled them. He was a dictator, of course. Uh, he did a lot of bad things. He did a lot of good things. You have to, if you're going to be historical about things rather than be led by, you know, Sky News or the front page of the Daily Mail, uh, you have to be able to, as I did with you with Tony Blair earlier, for example. Mm -hmm. I could have said to you, Tony Blair's a tow rag from A to Z, but that wouldn't be true. I told you the good things that he did. Mm -hmm. And you have to do that with uh, when you're looking at uh, eras or leaders or systems, unless you're going to be dishonest. Because mm -hmm. a lot of these men, do you think they were killed then through, from money, for money, the oil and the gold? Well, I do think Iraq was attacked uh, for oil. It was attacked for Israel. It was attacked though mainly to demonstrate America's overwhelming power in the world, mm -hmm. what we call hegemony, the hegemony, the dominance of uh, the US empire in the world. And paradoxically, of course, uh, it proved the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. It Can proved that the Americans don't rule the world and they never will. Because we know what the media plays a big part in people, what people watch or what they read, it sticks in their mind and they think the world's a bad place and I believe the world is a good place as well. I believe there's a lot of goodness in the world, George, and Amen. when people constantly watching the negative shit, they just, like, it's going to bring them down, they're going to be that they control and fit countries like Russia and Russia, I believe Russia is thriving and people look into it and they think it's totally. not. No, totally. It's the biggest economy in Europe. Moscow is the biggest city in Europe. Russia is the biggest country in Europe. Yeah, most people don't even know Russia's in Europe. Yeah. They talk about Europe as if it was a different place mm -hmm. to uh, Russia. No, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't myself vote for Putin, for example. I would have voted for his uh, communist opponent. Uh, but anyone who says that Putin hasn't done a good job for Russia would be lying. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're either stupid or they're lying. Mm -hmm. Anybody that said the Communist Party of China hadn't done a good job for China, would either be stupid or would be lying. Yeah, yeah I believe Putin's loved over there totally. because of the thing that has done. You were also attacked, George, 2014. What was that about? About Israel. Uh, it's the reason why I'm wearing a hat uh, during this interview indoors. Uh, I was quite seriously assaulted. I was hospitalized by a, a man wearing an Israeli army outfit. Uh, he attacked me from behind. As a former boxer, I'm, I'm fairly pleased that I kept my, my shape up well enough that 
I'm still the good-looking man that appears in front of you today, but I'm ashamed of the fact I literally did not land one single blow on him. He was half my age, but I'm still ashamed of it. I Believe me, I, I blush to the roots of my hair when I recall it, that I didn't land a single punch on him. Does that scare you, George, as well, when you ruffle a few feathers? Does it ever scare you to push you back a bit? And go, fuck this, no, this isn't worth it? No, it doesn't, no. Um, I mean, I, I don't want somebody to kill me, of course. I've got five children, uh, and I, I want to have more. Uh, Do you? But, yeah, but I'm ready to to face my maker uh, if it uh, comes. And I take precautions, not all of which I can tell you about on screen. <laughs> so for going on in the future for yourself... Obviously, you work every day. I know you're working on a film. Can you speak it? Elaborate yeah, on the film I'd a love bit? to. Thanks for the opportunity. I, I'm making a film called Killing Kelly, uh -huh. uh, which is uh, the story of the strange death of Dr. David Kelly, who was a British government weapons inspector in Iraq, uh, who burst into public consciousness when he told a BBC reporter that the government was lying about the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. He predicted that he would be found dead in the woods. And lo and behold, a few days later, he was found dead in the woods. Uh, it, was, um, it was the worst case of suicide anybody had ever seen. Uh, not many believed at the time uh, that he did actually commit suicide. And after they've seen my film, nobody will believe that David Kelly committed mm -hmm. suicide. It was crowdfunded. Uh, I did a crowdfunding appeal on Kickstarter. I raised over £60,000 to make the film. I'm in production now, and a highly acclaimed Irish director, Sean Murray, uh, is the director of the film. I'm the producer and the writer and presenter of it. It's a very disturbing, frightening story uh, that even someone, an OBE, with the highest possible security clearance, a servant of the state that would undoubtedly have finished his career with a knighthood, can end up dead in the woods in the circumstances I'll be telling you he ended up dead in. What, what made you get involved into that, George? Well, it has uh, the cast uh, that uh, constantly is in front of my eyes. Uh, he was outed by Alistair Campbell and Tony Blair, it was one is one of the casualties of the Iraq war against which I gave my every breath, you could argue my political life's blood. If there had been no Iraq war, I might still be the member of parliament for Glasgow Kelvin. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe you wouldn't have been interviewing me. Maybe <laughs> nobody in America would ever have heard of me. Mm -hmm. But the Iraq story has completely dominated uh, my life uh, and I often say as long as God gives me breath I will pursue Tony Blair until the ends of the earth and after me my sons does it ever does it hurt your heart George to see these wars and to see the pain that people go through in the families and these kids that are dying that people don't see and you need to really really search into these things to actually know these sh this, this shit is going on. People sit in their house to watch these tenders in Coronation Street and they don't realise actually what's going on in some of these countries. Does it hurt you and you make It you breaks sad? my heart, uh, particularly because you say there's injustice everywhere, there's wars everywhere, but when you know the people on the receiving end of unjust war, overwhelming firepower from bullies, uh, it, it breaks my heart. It, uh, when I meet someone from Iraq now, as I seem to do in London almost every day, I always uh, say to them, Iraq, Mina Ayuni, it's in my eyes. Iraq is in my eyes. It's in my blood. Uh, because over a period of, of years from, say, 1993 to 2003, I dreamt of Iraq. If, if I heard somebody say the word Iraq, I'd turn around as if they called my name. Uh, and it breaks my heart that for all our efforts, we were unable to stop the war. Even though millions of us marched against it, we were unable to stop it. And that every prediction we made came true. Uh, and that the consequence of it 
as I say, will be felt not just in our lifetime, but our children's, maybe even their children's. Uh, a poison was set into the bloodstream of world politics, uh, which we'll be lucky if it ever abates. Do you think we'll ever see peace in this world, George? No, but I think we have an obligation to struggle for it. Uh, I believe that life, and therefore public life, is a struggle uh, between good and evil. I believe in the angels on our shoulder, the good one, the bad one. I believe that that's why God gave us a conscience. Otherwise, why give us a conscience? You know, a lion doesn't have a conscience. Why have we got one? Uh, we've got a conscience because the divine intended us to make decisions about what is right and what is wrong. And I believe, you don't have to, but I believe that on the judgment day we'll be judged according to how we lived our lives. Uh, mm. Did we try to do right by and large uh, or did we try to do wrong? By yeah. and large. I think that's what Jesus meant when he said that it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into mm -hmm. heaven. Mm -hmm. I believe that's what that parable means. Yeah, there's a, I'm going off course here, but there's a book I read called Many Lives, Many Masters. It's um, the pain and misery you cause in this life. If you don't sort it here, whatever the problems you've got, if you don't sort it this life, you actually take it into the next life and add one on. So it's a fascinating book yeah, for I anybody watching. And it's I believe that. Obviously, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not too soon, I hope. Um, well, you, you, were, you were in labour, George, for 34 years, 36 years, and then you, get, you were out. What, what, how was your life after that experience as well, after giving something so much yeah, it's of your life? Yeah, you raised that because uh, it was like a stab in the heart for me. Uh, even though I knew it was coming because Blair had rigged a kangaroo court. But as I sat there with Michael Foote as my witness, my character reference, Tony Benn as my character reference, and they made their arguments, I thought, they can't go through with this. It's, it's, the case is just paper thin. It's not worth the paper that it's written on, but they did, and, and they... Uh, it was it was like a stab in the heart, and in a way, I have never recovered from it. It's been a long exile, 2003 till now, 16 years, an exile from something that I loved far more than the people who were papping me out of it loved. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I still regard myself as a part of the labor movement, and some friends of mine are now running the Labour Party, or at least on paper they are. Uh, Unfortunately, they are surrounded by a fifth column of enemies that make it very difficult for them. But it's my friends that are sitting in Downing Street today with the Prime Minister, almost in power. Mm -hmm. uh, not the Blairites. The Blairites are spitting blood outside. So that gives you some satisfaction. Does that, do you think that's what gives you the fuel then for that incident, for you to keep going, to keep fighting, to keep bringing things to yeah. light? Well, I, on the day I was expelled, I did say, I remember people laughing at the way I said it in a very Scottish way, I said that Tony Blair would rue the day that he expelled me. And I'm glad to say he's rued it more mm -hmm. than once. Because is, that, is that the power and they had at the time then when you the move up yeah. the ladder, you yeah. can just yeah. plant seeds well, in? Dr. John Reid that I spoke about earlier, he was the chairman of the Labour Party that expelled me. Mm -hmm. him that used to be a hardline communist uh -huh. he expelled me from the Labour Party for my role in opposing the war in Iraq go figure as the Americans say you've, um, you've had some career so far you work hard at it you do what you do and no matter what you do George you're going to ruffle a few feathers sure. before we finish up though I have to touch on the, the Big Brother incident oh yeah the, I thought we were going to talk about Celtic <laughs> the, the cat thing um, if I'm honest I think it's funny I think it's funny mm -hmm. um, at the time was it just going with it? it's, a, it's a game show isn't it? it's a game show the, and it's for charity uh -huh. so uh, you know there's a lot of uh, hypocrisy talked about it you know, children in need people famous people dress up and uh -huh and uh, make a fool of themselves for a good cause, mm -hmm. to raise money for children in need. And I, I was raising it for Palestinian children when not many other people were uh -huh. doing so. The problem is I did it too well. 
<laughs> if, I'd, if I'd just gone through the motions, uh -huh. uh, p people would long ago have forgotten it. I was starting I'd, to think you were a cat at that I, point. <laughs> I, I believe if, if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing well. <laughs> I think it's, it's fucking brilliant, but a lot of people know you from that as well. But on that Big Brother house as well, um, Jimmy Savile came in. Yeah, he did, yeah. yeah. Obviously, the extent of the shit that he was involved in didn't come out then. How was it then when he came in? Well, to be honest, after 22 days of sensory deprivation, uh, no radio, no TV, no newspapers, no books, no phone calls, uh, no internet, the internet hadn't been invented then, uh, more or less. Uh, you're basically going up the wall. You're, you're basically going crazy. So suddenly, of course, nobody in the house knew uh, then what uh, they know now uh, about uh, Savile. He promised me something that he, he broke his promise. He, he promised to, uh, I can't remember now if it was to, to get me a ticket for the Oscars. I think it was that. Uh, but I never heard from him again, so I only met him the once. Now that we know uh, what we know about him, uh, of course, one wishes that uh, Channel 4 hadn't brought him in. Yeah, because the slated you as well was an MP because you were going to the Big Brother house. Yeah, because it was in, the, in the Christmas holidays, but yeah, because it's, I only he, missed a couple of days. I of think you, you raised 60 grand as well for charity. At, 72. Uh, that doesn't get spoke about. No, no. Do you know what I mean? No. That, that? I also used my fee for public uh, works. Uh -huh. So I'd, not only did I raise a lot of money for Palestinian kids, I spent my fee on uh, assistance in our constituency office uh, in Bethnal Green and Bow to serve the, serve the people there. Yeah, which is an amazing thing. So how do you think Celtic are getting on this? I know you're a massive Celtic fan. What do you think yeah. of the scenario just now? With Brendan Rodgers leaving as well. Yeah, I don't agree with most Celtic supporters uh, about uh, Brendan Rodgers. Um, I don't hold that against him. Uh, and he's done a really good job at Leicester. He's done fantastic. Uh, I think that Brendan Rodgers... In the, look, if Celtic hadn't been happy with Brendan Rodgers' performance, they'd have sacked him. So he got an opportunity of a better job and he took it. And Leicester is a better job because it's a bigger stage. Uh, Celtic have now got Neil Lennon. I've written a book about Neil Lennon called Open Season, the Neil Lennon story. I think Neil Lennon is a perfect fit for Celtic and I think he'll take them all the way to the 10 in a row. Uh, so I don't think we should be churlish uh, about Brendan Rodgers. I, I, I drew up my chair on Sunday morning to watch the famous Glasgow Celtic playing a new team uh, on the block, uh, Sevco. Uh, <laughs> And I was a very happy man at the end of it. I had a smile wider than the cloud uh, at the end of it. Hell, hell. <laughs> is, um, f nearly finished, Georgie. Is, um, what do you think about, though, the violence in this, the Catholic and the Protestants in Glasgow, the Celtic Rangers after the game? Because there was a lot of trouble there. I think Sunday. there's someone clinging on to life, isn't there? One of the yeah. people who was and uh, I don't stabbed. Agree, I, yeah, I don't that. agree with that shit because it is only a game of football. But I think social media doesn't help because there's so much people getting wound up. Yeah. You can wind people up so yeah. much. Um, yeah. So what do you, how do you think that gets stopped? They're talking about maybe putting the game on a Monday night, which is I don't think will work anyway. How do you think, what's the best thing to put in place to get it brought down, stopped? Uh, it's very difficult because uh, I hate to contradict you, but it's not just a football game. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's much more than that. And Celtic is much more than a football club. Uh, and so is Rangers. Uh, these are manifestations of uh, a schizophrenia in Scotland. At least 20%, maybe 25% of Scottish people, I'm one of them, are from an Irish Catholic tradition. And a section, of course not all, not a majority, but not a small number either of supporters of Glasgow Rangers uh, are ethno-religious supremacists like the, their brethren in the north of Ireland. Uh, they, they think 
though they don't actually have many reasons to think because most of them don't have two pennies to rub together any more than our people do. Mm -hmm. uh, their arse is hanging out mm -hmm. their trousers just like it's hanging yeah. out of many of our people's <laughs> uh, trousers. But they think that they are somehow better than us mm -hmm. or to put it as they do, we are the people. Well, we're all the people, uh, them and us. We have to find a way of coexisting together in a small country mm. of five million people uh, and enjoy the rivalry that will always be there and treat it more as a sporting occasion rather than a rerun of the Battle of the Boyne yeah. in 16 and 90. I, I'm older than you, a lot older than you, so I remember when you couldn't get a job cutting the grass at Ibrox if you were a Roman Catholic. Literally, you could not get a job cleaning the floor there, never mind playing in the team. But actually, there are as many Catholics in the Rangers team now than there are Celtic. in the Celtic team. Uh, uh, Graham Soonis did a big job, a great, great job. And, and David Murray, by the way, uh, who's not often praised. Uh, they, they took bold and significant steps uh, away from that. And yet, you've still got people running into boozers and stabbing yeah. Celtic fans in the back and mm -hmm. shouting metaphorically, we are the people. And all my life, they, they sang, we're up to our knees in Fenian blood, and they meant my blood. Uh, I am a Fenian. I'm proud to be a Fenian. I'll end with a funny story. In my first election, I was on top of a campaign bus in Byers Road in Glasgow, 1987, and a pan loafy woman shouts up from the pavement. We don't know what she's saying because we're playing music. We switch the music off, and I say, what's that you're saying? And she says, we know what you are. And I say, what am I? She says, you're nothing but a Fenian bastard. <laughs> and my mother folds her arms like Les Dawson and says with a microphone still picking it up, he may be a Fenian, but I can assure you he's no bastard. <laughs> <laughs> George, how can people get in contact with you? How can they watch your stuff? How can they? Good, yeah, thanks. They can follow me on Twitter at George Galloway. My website is georgegalloway.com. I've got a, um, a thumpingly good uh, YouTube channel, I think, George Galloway Official. You can follow me on Facebook, George Galloway Official. I've got a million and a half followers on social media. I hope you'll join them. Yeah, get involved, man. He's active and loves that. And yes, you're very friendly. Speak to the people and you give your time. But George, yeah. for coming on my show today, I really appreciate Pleasure it. Pleasure and the best of luck to you. Yeah, you're doing a great that. job. Thank great, you. great job. Um, the fact that people are queuing up to get on your yeah. podcasts is a tribute Shows to you and your colleagues. Right, yeah, I yeah, appreciate yeah. it. So thank you. All power to Cheers. you. Cheers. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.